Betty Davis. That's Betty with a capital B. Magnetic, fascinating, intense, passionate, driven. Davis reigned supreme on the silver screen during the 1930s and 40s. She was loving and she was incapable of love. She was devoted and she was destructive. But at the height of her glory, scandal threatened to ruin Betty's career. On this episode of Mysteries and Scandals, we'll explore the strange, sudden death of Betty's second husband. When she sort of pushed him off the train, the train was going a little too fast, and it was her feeling that that's what caused his death. I think Betty Davis gave meaning to the phrase, um, with friends like her who needs an enemy. We're all busy little bees, full of stings, making honey day and night. Aren't we, honey? We'll also show how battling Betty went toe-to-toe -to -toe with nearly every Hollywood big shot and beat him. When she believed in something, she fought for it. You know, she fought Jack Warner. She was a very strong lady. She did try to break her contract with Warner Brothers, so she was uh, really a feisty uh, groundbreaker. She was always, you know, ready for the battle. So you pointed out so often, so many qualities so often. Her loyalty, efficiency, devotion, warmth and affection, and so young, so young and so fair. Betty Davis didn't let anyone or anything stand in her way. I'm A.J. Benza. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy show. The motion picture career of Betty Davis spanned 60 years. She starred in more than 125 films, snagged 10 Best Actress nominations and two Oscars. Betty burned through four disastrous marriages and raised hell with almost every studio head, co-star and director she ever worked with. No wonder she chain smoked. Star maker Jay Bernstein. Betty worked so hard to be perfect and she knew that anyone can be likable, but it really takes guts to be hated. And she knew she was hated, but she didn't care. But what was it that made Betty such a, I want to say witch, but that's not quite right. Ruth Elizabeth Davis, better known as Betty, came into this world with a fury on April 5th, 1908 in Lowell, Massachusetts. Film producer Mike Kaplan. She was born with that. The night that she was born, lightning struck the tree in front of her house. And I think that was a sign of what her life was going to be. She was going to be a real feisty dynamo and create electricity wherever she went. Historian Jack Allen. Her father and she were not close over the years. Her father left the home when she was eight years old. Betty and her sister Barbara were raised by their mother Ruthie who encouraged Betty's interest in acting. Author Sam Staggs. Betty was interested in theater. Then she got a role in Broadway early on. One thing led to another and in the early 1930s Betty Davis came to Hollywood and they were quite unimpressed by her looks. They thought she had uh, every kind of look except the look that a movie star should have. In 1930, 22-year-old Betty married longtime sweetheart Harmon Nelson. She also landed a contract with Universal. When she first came to Hollywood, they would make fun of her pop eyes. So she said, look, I'll play anything. Maybe, but the executives at Universal obviously didn't see it her way. They dropped Betty's contract within a year. In 1931, Davis was snatched up by Warner Brothers. Unfortunately, Betty hated the mediocre role she was forced to play. She was getting more and more frustrated and, and more and more vociferous with Jack Warner. And finally, he just got tired of being annoyed by Betty and broke down and let her have the job she wanted, which was being loaned out to RKO. She was pursuing a movie called Of Human Bondage. She got the part, she did the movie, and was brilliant. Back at Warner Brothers, Davis starred the 1936 film Dangerous, which won her an Oscar. You'd think Warner would have given Betty more challenging roles. Instead, Get this, Warner wanted Betty to play a female lumberjack in her next film. Let's just say Betty tried to ax the idea. She had the grit to put her foot down and say, I'm not doing it, to Jack Warner. Sue me. Jack Warner owned Betty Davis. She tried to get out of her contract. Jack Warner, of course, absolutely refused to let her out of it. She planned to make a film in England. Warner got an injunction in London to keep her from working. She bucked this, she decided to take him to court. Betty Davis lost a major battle in her career. Director Vincent Sherman worked with Betty. The fight caused Warner to respect her much more and did change the, his attitude toward her, you see. And the fight 
resulted in Warner's giving her a little more respect and she getting better pictures. In 1938, Betty was set to star in the film Jezebel for top-notch director William Wyler. The two developed a close relationship. She thought he was absolutely wonderful. She loved him and she had great hopes that he might become her next husband. He rather pulled the rug out from under all that. See, by the time Davis obtained a divorce from Ham Nelson in 1940, Wyler was already married to someone else. The jilted actress went on vacation and married the first man she met, an innkeeper named Arthur Farnsworth. Guess the room service was more than satisfactory. Up next, a sudden death raises a cloud of suspicion over Betty Davis. Did this Tinseltown diva have blood on her hands? wanted a railroad, but I feel that you're both old enough to realize that your country's at war and to be willing to make sacrifices for it. Just think, if Daddy were wounded, one single war stamp might pay for the medicine that would save him from pain. In 1941, Betty Davis was the hottest female star in Hollywood. Davis told friends she only felt alive when she was acting, and man, could she act. After winning her second Best Actress Oscar for Jezebel in 1938, Davis sniffed out a new challenge. In 1941, she starred in The Little Foxes. Betty gave the kind of chilling performance no other leading lady in Hollywood could pull off. Betty Davis in The Little Foxes is a breakthrough role in a way, but Betty Davis, throughout her career, kept breaking through. The Little Foxes gave Betty Davis an opportunity again to play the bitch role to the hilt. And Regina Giddens was one of the most horrific, heartless, characters that she portrayed. But you should have caught the scene she made when the cameras were off. Betty was so intimidating while she was at Warner Brothers, they called her the fifth Warner Brother. She showed no mercy because acting was her life. That's why she fought with everybody on nearly every movie. Betty Davis and actress Miriam Hopkins had a major feud on the set of Old Acquaintance. There were a couple, only a couple of actresses that Betty worked with that she insisted were absolute bitches. One of them was Miriam Hopkins. It got really ugly with Betty and Miriam. It was a, a frightening kind of competition. During the, the picture, um, Betty and Miriam would sort of uh, maneuver. I said, ladies, some days I feel like I'm not directing this picture, but I'm refereeing it. After the picture wrapped, Davis dropped a bombshell on Sherman. She said, uh, we had a little trouble with Miriam, but you handled her beautifully, and I love you. I said, well, I love you too. And with that, she reached over and took my hand, and she said, you don't understand. I mean, I really love you. I was stunned. Not one to beat around the bush, Davis propositioned the married director. She said to me, how would you like to join me in Mexico City? Two days before she left, I got a call from her husband, Arthur Farnsworth. He says, last night, Betty and I had a couple of drinks and had an argument. And she told me she was in love with you and that she was going to Mexico City and you were going to meet her in Mexico City. I felt very sorry for him. Sherman felt even worse for Farnsworth on August 23rd, 1943, the day Betty's husband suddenly died. Arthur Farnsworth uh, dropped dead one day um, in Hollywood, walking down the street, uh, either at a stroke or an embolism or something, but he hit the ground very hard on his head, cracked his head open. Betty was horrified. Nobody ever really quite knew what the cause of death was. It was mysterious. There were rumors that Betty Davis had had something to do with it. The mother of the dead husband felt there was something wrong and asked for an autopsy, which showed that he had fallen prior to his final fall that killed him. Now, the stories were varied. One story was that a jealous husband had hit him on the head a few weeks before. Another story was that he accidentally fell down the stairs at his home where he lived with Betty Davis. Sherman recalls a startling confession Davis made to him in confidence. Remember that train trip Betty was going to take to Mexico? Seems Arthur Farnsworth tried to put a stop to it. She said he kept taunting me and he had been drinking. And I got up and I pushed him toward the door where the platform was for you to get off the train. And she said, and I said, get off the train. It's going too fast. It's going faster. Get off. And he had fallen and he was sitting there holding his head. She said, I think 
That's when he hurt himself, which later resulted, you know, in his death. I could see why she felt guilty. And she was crying, my God. She was under a cloud for a while. It was a very sensationalized uh, rumor that went around. I think Betty Davis was capable of many, many things, but not of murder. Okay, maybe not murder, but how about aggravated assault? Betty Davis was never charged with any wrongdoing in connection with the death of husband number two. In any case, the grief-stricken widow wasn't in mourning for long. She began a torrid affair with Vincent Sherman. She was very sexy, but sex for her, I think, was an actual physiological need. It was a pile-up of energy, and she had so damn much energy. She was pent up. That was relaxing for her. During that period, she wanted me to get a divorce and marry her. When Sherman turned her down, Davis turned her back on the director for good. Coming up, Davis hits middle age and her career hits the skids. But this champ still had some knockout punches left in her. I'll admit I may have seen better days, but I'm still not to be had for the price of a cocktail. Like a salted peanut. By 1946, Betty Davis was still the undisputed queen of Warner Brothers, but her crown was losing its sparkle. Davis couldn't push her way around in Hollywood the way she used to, and at home, she was the one getting shoved. Betty Davis met William Grant Sherry in the mid-1940s. They got married, and on their way to uh, Mexico for the honeymoon, they had an enormous quarrel. He pushed her out of the car. She threw things at him, but they made up, and soon a daughter was born. B.D., Barbara Davis Sherry. They fought constantly. Uh, in reviewing her marriage to Sherry, uh, Betty would always just kind of bottom line him as, as the husband who gave her her daughter. By 1948, Betty's films were beginning to lose money. It was a low point in her life because she really was going down. Betty Davis was mocked in Hollywood. She was considered washed up. In 1949, 41-year-old Betty Davis was hung out to dry. Betty Davis was fired from Warner Brothers. And after 18 years at Warner Brothers, she was suddenly unemployed. There was no farewell dinner. In 1950, Davis got a call from Daryl Zanuck at 20th Century Fox. Sam Staggs is the author of All About, All About Eve. He said, how would you like to play Margot Channing in All About Eve? And she needed about uh, three cigarettes at the same time. She was so excited. And she was signed and on her way to San Francisco in, in a matter of a couple of weeks. In the meantime, the marriage to William Grant Sherry was completely over. There was a bodyguard during the filming of All About Eve because Betty Davis was afraid that her husband would uh, somehow come and, and uh, beat her up. Eve, my understudy. Didn't you know? Of course I knew. Despite the tense atmosphere, or perhaps because of it, Davis managed to give one of the greatest performances of her career. Oh, you pointed out so often. So many qualities so often. Her loyalty, efficiency, devotion, warmth and affection, and so young. So young and so fair. All About Eve is about an aging actress whose career and whose personal life are in trouble. The actress is called Margot Channing, but she could just as easily have been called Betty Davis. But everything in the world depended on the success of this picture. And please stop acting as if I were the queen mother. I'm sorry I didn't Outside mean. of a beehive, Margot, your behavior would hardly be considered either queenly or motherly. You're in a beehive, pal, didn't you know? We're all busy little bees, full of stings, making honey day and night. Aren't we, honey? All About Eve really was a stunning glory for Betty. It really brought her back to the top. She was nominated for Best Actress, unfortunately lost, and was very disappointed to have lost. Betty Davis found a professional comeback and husband number four practically the same week. She met Gary Merrill at the very outset of filming All About Eve. Gary Merrill, who was her leading man, fell in love with her character, Margot Channing, and not her. Can't imagine why. Gary Merrill was a drinker. Uh, Betty had been a light drinker. Um, their drinking accelerated as the relationship got more tense. She was drinking in the morning, you know, she was drinking scotch. They were both physical. Uh, they were drunk, they were 
hostile, violent, and it led to abuse. It led to all-out fights. The more they quarreled, the more they drank. The more their two careers went down the tubes, the more they drank. But their cocktails weren't all that was on the rocks. Straight ahead, more bitter feuds, another great comeback, and a final blow that may have pushed Betty Davis into her grave. I have things concealed, vile things. Where do you suppose I'll keep them? Haven't you guessed? By 1960, Betty Davis' ten-year marriage to husband number four, actor Gary Merrill, fell apart in a haze of booze and fistfights. Alone and desperate for work, Davis was offered a starring role in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, opposite Joan Crawford. Betty hated Joan Crawford. They were natural enemies. Betty supposedly said once that the most fun she ever had with Joan Crawford was pushing her down the stairs. She also said, I would not on Joan Crawford if she were on fire. Betty would say things like that Joan Crawford was Hollywood's first case of syphilis. Despite the feuding, whatever happened to Baby Jane was a hit and revived Betty's career. In 1964, Davis was teamed with another Hollywood icon, Susan Hayward. Actor Mike Connors starred with the duo in Where Love Has Gone. Now, Betty Davis and Susan Hayward did not get along. They were in stiff competition, and they were vying as to who was going to be the real star of the movie. And so, every scene, Betty Davis would rewrite the scene. Finally, Susan Hayward said, I'm not going to deal with this. And Betty Davis took off her gray wig, threw it in Susan Hayward's face. And Susan was in shock. And she said, bitch. And Betty Davis put her hands on her hips and said, what was it you said to me? And Susan Hayward, as she walked away, said, bitch, bitch, bitch. During the rest of the 1960s, Betty was relegated to mostly B-movies. Betty was struggling to find a good follow-up movie to Baby Jane. Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte was a good film, but it never quite achieved the box office of its predecessor. From there, Betty found herself in a series of movies that were less exciting. To take on uh, some of the roles she took on late in her career, I think she did because she was bored and unhappy. And then Betty made a movie called The Nanny in 1965, which was a horrific film in which she played this killer nanny who drowns uh, a little girl. What happened in the bathroom, nanny? I'm sure I don't know what you mean. What happened? Miss Penn, go back to bed. What happened? Betty's career situation didn't improve in the 70s and 80s. Now cause total chaos. As always, Davis brought an intensity to each role that no other actor would or could. She finally found herself making a movie called Bunny O'Hare uh, with Ernest Borgnine, where she ran around like a hippie on the back of a motorcycle. It was pretty, a pretty frightening come down for a star of Betty's echelon. If you don't put all the money you've got in this paper bag, I'm going to open you up like a can of tomato soup. Unlike a fine wine, Davis never mellowed with age. When Joan Crawford died in the spring of 1977, Davis had nothing nice to say. Betty Davis said, My mother always told me to speak good of the dead. Joan Crawford is dead. Good. But Father Time and a half century of smoking unfiltered cigarettes by the carton were catching up to Davis. In the early 1980s, Betty Davis had a stroke. And not long after, she discovered breast cancer. But then the final blow, the, the blow that, that, in a sense, killed her, that was the publication of her daughter, B.D. Hyman's book, My Mother's Keeper. Her daughter was on TV and doing all the interviews. It was basically that she was a very manipulative mother and difficult and demanding. But it was like a tell-all. Betty was devastated by her daughter's book, absolutely, totally devastated. She truly thought that her relationship was, with her daughter was, was strong. Betty Davis never expected such a vicious, horrible attack from her daughter, and the attack came when Betty Davis could no longer really fight and defend herself. Betty recovered enough to appear in the 1987 film The Whales of August, produced by Mike Kaplan. Physically, she wasn't in, in great shape, and I think that all of the demons that I, I think were always inside her and that she needed to work were accentuated. Her general crankiness, and a lot of times she made, I think, her life more difficult, you know, than it had to be. 
but it wouldn't have been Betty Davis if it was easy. The last time I saw her, I was shocked at her appearance. She seemed very small and shrunken, and all of that power that she had in, in, when I worked with her was all gone, and she was just a little old lady. After a long battle with cancer, 81-year-old Betty Davis died on October 6, 1989, in Paris, France. No actress had, in my opinion, captured the public's imagination as she did. Uh, she opened up a, a kind of a new, uh, a new category of performance. And audiences knew that when they went to see a Betty Davis picture, uh, she was going to be raging with, with talent and, uh, um, and giving it at all. Betty Davis was a female role model before that term was ever invented. Had she have been male, she would never have been termed difficult. She fought for every role she got. She had the tenacity and the unmitigated drive to go for what she wanted. If you go to a gravestone, it says she did it the hard way. <laughs> yeah, but the lady sure had style. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me the next time we do it the hard way here in a state of mind called Hollywood. Betty Davis said, I want to die acting. I want to die acting. She felt that when there was a caricature made of her, that that was just the tax that you pay on fame.